MBK 1 44 Panic Among the Koravas Chapter 44 Panic Among the Koravas Doryodhan had risen early on the day of the assembly. He knew Sanjaya was going to deliver Yadhishthira's message. After performing his morning ablutions and receiving the worship and praise of the palace Brahmins and bards, the prince met with Shakuni and Karna. He expressed his determination not to return the Pandavas' kingdom. His friends agreed and cheered him. They encouraged him to remain firm and assured him that his old father, bound by ties of affection, would not force him to return Indraprastha if he was resolute. As they spoke, the three men slowly made their way to the assembly hall, which shone like the hem of it mountain in the early morning sunlight. Dhritarashtra entered the hall at the head of all other kings. Led by Vidura, he made his way to his throne. The floor in the hall had been sprinkled lightly with perfumes and spread with flower petals. The kings took their places on seats made of carved ivory and wood, decorated with golden inlays and precious stones. As they settled onto the silk cushions, they looked around to see who was present. Immediately surrounding Dhritarashtra were Vidura, Bhishma, Drona, Kripa, Shalaya, Kritavarma, Jayadratha, Palika, Somadatta, Ashvathama, as well as Duryodhana and his one hundred brothers. The chamber, filled with so many heroes, seemed like a cave full of lions. The lustrous men, with their bright silks and golden ornaments, lit up the hall and appeared like an assembly of the gods. When everyone was seated, the doorkeeper announced that Sanjaya had arrived and was waiting to deliver his message. Dhritarashtra gave permission for him to enter the hall. Sanjaya, his gold earrings swinging, bowed at Dhritarashtra's feet. Folding his palms, he faced the assembly and said, O oh, sons of Karu, I have just returned from the Pandavas. Those virtuous men salute you all, each according to your age and status. Hear now the messages they have sent through me, Sanjaya carefully relayed Yudhishthira's message exactly as he had heard it, either the Kaurus should return the Pandava's kingdom, or even just five villages, or there would be war Dhritarashtra said nothing. He looked pensive. After some moments he said, I wish to hear Arjuna's message, for it is from him that we face the greatest danger Krishna's friend, Arjuna, is immeasurably powerful and has suffered at her hands. Tell me, Sanjaya, what did Dhananjaya, the destroyer of sinful men, say Sanjaya about his head to the king and remain standing? These were the words of the wrathful Arjuna, who was eager to fight and who, with reddened eyes, spoke in the presence of Yudhishthira and Krishna, summoning the mood in which Arjuna had spoken, Sanjaya delivered his exact words, speak to Dhritarashtra's son in the midst of the Kaurus, and in the hearing of the wicked-minded Karna who always desires to fight, speaks harshly, has a dull intellect, and is extremely ignorant. His time has come. Speak also in the presence of those kings who have come from around the world to fight the Pandavas. If Doryodhan does not surrender Yudhishthira's kingdom, then it is clear that he desires to pay for his former antagonism toward the Pandavas. If he chooses battle, then our ends will be achieved. Tell him not to choose peace but to choose to fight with me and Bhima, Nakula and Sahadev, Satyaki and Drishtad do not, and Shikandi. I look forward to it. Although we have lain on a bed of woe these last thirteen years, let Dhritarashtra's son, when he lies dead on the battlefield, obtain a bed of endless woe. He could never conquer the virtuous Yudhishthira in a fight. Therefore, he resorted to trickery and deceit Pandu's eldest son, whose senses and mind are fully under control, has patiently endured all his suffering. When he directs his anger against the Kauravas, then will Doryodhan have cause to repent. Doryodhan sneered as Sanjaya continued Arjuna described how he envisioned the war between them taking place. As a blazing fire in the summer consumes dried grass, so will the Kaurava army be consumed even by Yudhishthira's glance. When Doryodhan sees the iron-clad Bhimasena on his chariot, mace in hand and vomiting the venom of his wrath, then will he repent this war. When that exceedingly vain one sees Bhima felling elephants by the thousands, their warriors dispatched to the next world, then will he repent. When Nakula comes down from his chariot, clutching his sword and raising warriors as if they were a field of corn, then will the wicked one repent. When Sahadev chops off the heads of kings with his well-aimed arrows, and when he finally encounters the vicious Shakuni, then will Doryodhan repent, one by one Arjuna mentioned all the great warriors who would fight for the Pandavas. 
describing how they would wreak vengeance on the core of us. Drishtadyana would kill Drona and Shikandi would slay Bhishma. Bhima had already vowed to slay Doryodhan and all his brothers. Arjuna would destroy warriors by the tens of thousands. Finally he would kill Karna and all his sons and followers. Arjuna painted a grim picture of the war's outcome, which he saw ending in the total annihilation of Doryodhan and his forces. Finally he spoke about Krishna. I have selected Krishna as my charioteer in preference to Indra and his thunderbolt weapon. If Krishna desires someone's victory, even if he himself does not fight, that person cannot fail. Our victory will be easy. Whoever desires to overpower Krishna wishes to swim the unfathomable ocean or to put out a blazing fire with his two hands, or to stop the sun and moon in their course through the heavens. That best of men, the lord of all the worlds, has already slain demons more powerful than Doryodhan. Even the invincible Naruka, son of the earth, who could easily withstand the gods in battle, succumbed to Krishna's irresistible weapons. Doryodhan desires to defeat Krishna, who is the supreme Vishnu, either by capturing him or by winning him over to the core of a side. That fool will soon realize his ignorance, through their spies, the Pandavas were aware of the Kauravas' strategies. Arjuna knew that Duryodhan feared Krishna and was thinking of how to deal with him. The Kaurava prince even considered capturing him when he came to Hastinapura on his peace mission. Arjuna ended his speech by describing the omens he saw, without my touch the Gandiva bow stretches. My arrows move out of their quiver on their own accord. My polished sword leaps from its scabbard. Near my banners I heard, when will your chariot be yoked? Alkirati at night, crowds of jackals howl gleefully and vultures and crows descend from the sky. All these signs indicate carnage. These omens will prove true when I hurl my celestial weapons in all directions. I will leave no trace of the core of our army. O Sanjaya, tell this to Doryodhan in the hearing of the king, Bhishma, Drona, Kripa, and the wise Vidura. I will surely act as these elders say. Let them check the evil Doryodhan or let the war begin. The assembly was silent. Doryodhan looked nonchalantly around the hall, smirking. Karna fumed and clutched his ivory hilted sword. Seeing Doryodhan's indifference, Bhishma addressed him gravely. O oh, Prince, listen as I recount an ancient history. Once all the gods went to visit Brahma. Arriving at his abode they saw two beautiful, blazing personalities illuminating even that shining region by their splendor. Brahma told the gods that these two were Naraha and Naraya and Narishis. They were forever practicing asceticism for the good of the worlds, and they lived to destroy the demons. The gods had come to Brahma out of fear of the Asuras and, headed by Brihaspati, they approached those Torishis and begged that they help them defeat their enemies. Assisted by Naraha and Naraya and Narishi's invincible power, the gods triumphed over the Asuras. Now those Torishis among the gods have appeared as Krishna and Arjuna. Such as the general belief Arjuna has already shown his prowess by slaying thousands of demons in the celestial realm. The son of Vasudeva has also killed innumerable demons. Together they have vanquished the gods at Khandava, and together they will fight us. Bhishma looked penetratingly at Doryodhan, who moved uncomfortably on his throne. He did not want to hear about his enemy's power. Anyway, why should he worry? He thought of the Danuva's assurances and remembered how they would possess his forces. Soon he would be seeing a different Bhishma, and soon the Pandavas would be facing an army more powerful than they had anticipated. Bhishma concluded his speech. Naraha and Naraya and Nar repeatedly take birth in this world to annihilate the miscreants and demons. It was Narada Rishi who told us this. O oh child, when you see these two seated on the same chariot, armed for battle, then you will remember my words. By desiring to fight with them you have lost sight of both virtue and profit. Do not encounter them in battle. If you ignore my advice, you will see your warrior slain. But it seems that you will only listen to the advice of three persons, Karna, who is the son of a Suda and has been cursed by his guru, the cunning Shakuni, and your small-minded brother Dushashana, Karna was already seething from Arjuna's speech. Now he was infuriated. Springing to his feet he exclaimed, It is unfair that you speak of me in such a way, O grandfather. I follow Akshatriya's duties and have not abandoned virtue. Why do you always revile me? I wish only for the Kauru's good Dhritarashtra's sons are honestly ruling the world. Why should they give the kingdom to their enemies? To serve Dhritarashtra I will slay the Pandavas in battle, Karna roared and then took his seat. Pishma looked at him sadly, then, 
turning toward Dhritarashtra, said, O king, although the Sudha's son brags of his power, he is not even a sixteenth part of the Pandavas. You should know that this fool is largely responsible for this calamity about to befall your sons. Encouraged by his empty promises, Doryodhan is ready to face Arjuna in battle. Your weak brain son, depending upon Karna, has insulted the Pandavas. What can this vain man achieve that is even approaching what Arjuna has achieved? What could he do when Arjuna killed his brother in the fight against the Matsyas? What did he do when your son was carried away by the Gandharavas? Yet he roars like a bull in the assembly. Ignorant of virtue and profit, he simply speaks whatever comes to his mind. Bhishma sat down. Karna kept his head down and said nothing. Bhishma's words cut him deeply. He longed for the chance to prove him wrong. The sooner he could face Arjuna in battle the better. It would be different next time Indra Shakti weapon would settle the dispute once and for all. Why had he not had it with him at the Rata? Somehow it had not occurred to him to bring that weapon. He had not been expecting to meet Arjuna. Well, he would not make that same mistake again. Then Bhishma would be silenced. Drona had listened carefully to everything that had been said. Seeing his opportunity, he rose to speak. Facing Dhritarashtra, the old martial preceptor said, Take heed of Bhishma's words and follow his advice, O king. You should not let yourself be guided by those who covet wealth and are slaves to desire. Peace with the Pandavas is without doubt the best course. What Arjuna has submitted to us through Sanjaya will surely come to pass if we fight. In all the three worlds, no one wields a bull like him. Drona, Bhishma and Vidura each looked expectantly at Dhritarashtra. But the old king remained silent. Ignoring their advice, he asked Sanjaya to repeat what the other Pandavas had said. What did the large-minded Yudhishthira say when he heard that we had amassed a huge army? Who is looking up to him for orders and who is trying to dissuade him from war? What is that virtuous one, wronged by my wicked sons, now planning Sanjaya, who had been seated while the others had been speaking, came again to the center of the assembly? All the Panchalas now look up to Yudhishthira, as well as the Matsyas and Kekiyas. All those tribes, down to the last herdsman, are ready to do his bidding. Clad in a coat of mail he sits amid their chieftains like Indra amid the gods, tell me in detail more about Yudhishthira's forces. Also, please describe Drishtaduna's army and the army of the Somakus, as Sanjaya recalled the sight of those troops he became stunned and fell silent. He drew a long sigh. His mind was overwhelmed with fear and he suddenly fainted. Vidura said loudly, Sanjaya, recalling the mighty sons of Kunti and their assembled troops, has lost control of his senses. He cannot utter a word. Dhritarashtra asked a servant to sprinkle cool water on Sanjaya's face. The sight of the tigers among men has filled him with terror, Vidura repeated. Console him with comforting words, O king, and let him continue his report once his mind is peaceful. After some moments, Sanjaya came to his senses. Reassured by Dhritarashtra, he drank some water and stood again to address the assembly. I have seen, O great king, those mighty heroes arrayed in armor like a pride of angry lions. At their head stands the ever-truthful Yudhishthira, who never departs from virtue out of desire or fear. He is ready to fight even the gods if need be. By his side stands the terrible Bhimasena, whose strength equals that of ten thousand elephants and who has slain Rakshasas with his bare hands. Bhima brought down the powerful Yakshas on the Gandhya Madana mountain, and he slew Kichika and all his followers. Then there is Arjuna, whose glories have already been described and who is fired with wrath. He is repeatedly bending the Gandiva and uttering war cries. He satisfied the immortal Shiva in a fight and was given the celestial weapons. Next Madri's two sons, the powerful twins, stand ready with their terrible weapons, breathing hot and heavy sighs. Sanjaya spoke of all the principal warriors on the Pandava's side. He mentioned Shikandi, who, according to prophesy, was destined to kill Bhishma, and Drishtaduna, destined to kill Drona. As he named the many great heroes aligned against the Kauravas, Doryodhan and Karnuskov to Dhritarashtra, however, became fearful. When Sanjaya stopped speaking, the king began to address the assembly. O oh Sanjaya, all these you have named are powerful and courageous fighters, but Bhima is equal to them all. He gives me the greatest fear. We are like deer facing an enraged and hungry tiger. Many a night have I remained sleepless, 
thinking about the furious Bhima rushing at my sons with mace in hand. I do not see anyone in our army who can face him. When wrathful he is an implacable foe who tears through the battlefield like a tornado. He will surely put an end to my wicked sons. Seeing him advance toward them, they will meet with a calamity equal to meeting the god of death wielding his staff. Bhima will roam among my sons as a fully grown lion roams among a herd of deer. From his childhood he has been inimical to Doryodhan and his brothers. Finding the opportunity on the battlefield, he will not hesitate to annihilate all of them. O oh, Sanjaya, it is only by good fortune that he has not already killed my sons for the wrongs they have inflicted upon him and his brothers. Tritarashtra went on to describe the threat Bhima posed to his sons. Sweat ran down his face and he clenched his fists as he spoke Bhima's vow to kill his sons gave him the greatest anxiety. The kings and ministers in the hall looked at him with pity as he concluded his speech. Destiny is surely all-powerful. Even though I see my son's inevitable death, still I do not dissuade them from their aims. Because they all desire to traverse the eternal, noble and heavenly path, they will part with their lives in battle and ensure their everlasting fame on earth. Perhaps our only hope now lies in the support of our three aged, Wazieros, Bhishma, Drona and Kripa. They will doubtlessly repay the support and kindness we have given them by coming out for battle against the Pandavas. Even though the sons of Kunti are as dear to them as my sons, they will not avoid their duty. For Akshatriya to meet death in the line of duty is commendable. It leads to glorious regions of bliss. It seems to me, Sanjaya, that knowledge does not destroy woe, rather, distress destroys knowledge. As I contemplate the impending destruction of the Korus, Grief bewilders my senses and confounds my mind. I cannot let go of my attachment for my sons, the kingdom, my wife, my grandsons, and a thousand other things. Such blind attachment leads only to suffering. Dhritarash Trasai Bhishma and Vidura looked at him in despair. He could clearly understand what would happen should they fight the Pandavas, but still he would not save the situation. All he had to do was give his sons the order to cease hostilities and the war would be finished before it began. Although Doryodhan officiated as the monarch, his father still occupied the throne as the head of state. If the king ordered the prince to make peace with the Pandavas, he would have to obey. But Dhritarashtra showed no signs of giving such an order. He seemed resigned to actualize the death and destruction of everyone and everything he held dear. The two ministers looked at each other, Hopelessly, as the king continued, this great calamity the Korus now face owes its existence to the dice game. My son is at fault because he is filled with avarice. This is the work of eternal time. Bound by time I am helpless in the face of my own ruination. What can I do? Where will I go? O oh, Sanjaya, the foolish Korus will all be killed by time and I can do nothing about it. I will hear news of my hundred sons dying and then hear the loud wailing of women. Only I will be left alive. How will death touch me? As a raging fire consumes a dry forest, so Bhima and Arjuna will consume my army. The king then described Arjuna's prowess, whom he considered no less a danger than Bhima. He knew Arjuna was truthful and would not kill any of his sons out of respect for Bhima's vow, but he would certainly not restrain himself with the rest of the Korova forces. Although I think about it day and night, I do not see a warrior on earth who can stand against the Gundiva bow. Dhritarashtra's voice was almost choking. Some may think that either Karna or Drona can withstand him, but I do not share that view. Karna is careless and passionate, and the preceptor is old and weakened by affection for Arjuna. No one can kill Arjuna, nor will battle with him result in anything but his own victory. The authorities have assured us of this truth, and the Korus have witnessed his strength with their own eyes. With Keshava guiding his chariot and the Gundiva in his hand, Arjuna will be irresistible in battle. The fools under Doryodhan's control do not know this. When a thunderbolt falls on one's head, something may be left behind. When Arjuna's arrows fall on one's head, however, nothing will be left behind. I can see him now in my mind's eye, coursing through our troops, his arrows flying in all directions and beheading countless warriors. Could anyone face the combined might of Arjuna and Bhima and survive? Whomever providence wills to be destroyed will not escape. Alice, the time for the Korus destruction is imminent, Dhritarashtra fell silent. If his sons were destined to die, then it would come to pass. But perhaps destiny would dictate some other outcome. After all, 
Who could have foreseen that the noble Pandavas would have to give up their kingdom and enter the forest? Maybe their victory was not so certain. The king hardly dared to hope for his own victory. How could the Pandavas be overcome while they were supported by that unfathomable Krishna? Weeping and sighing repeatedly, Dhritarashtra said, Although you have told me of the Pandavas' powerful forces, there is one who equals all of them and more. That mighty one could, by his desire, bring all the worlds under his control. That person is Krishna. He seems to have set his mind on the Pandavas' victory. It seems hopeless for my party. My heart quakes as I think of Yudhishthira's wrath, Bhima's prowess, the strength of Arjuna and the twins, and Krishna's inconceivable powers. What fool, desiring death, would fall like a moth into the inextinguishable pond of a fire? We have treated those heroes deceitfully. As a result, my sons will have to die. O Korus, do not fight. If you wage war, then our race will be annihilated. Let us seek peace Yudhishthira will not disregard me, especially upon seeing my distress, the king trailed off in tears. The rest of the assembly regarded him silently. What could anyone say Dhritarashtra had said nothing about giving back Yudhishthira's kingdom? His desire for peace was an empty hope born of fear. He would not pay the price to bring peace. War was certain Sanjaya again approached the assembly, his hands clasped, and said, O great king, it will be exactly as you say. That the Kshatriyas will be destroyed by the Gandiva bow is obvious. I cannot understand how you, who can clearly see this truth, still allow yourself to be controlled by your sons. This is not the time to give way to grief. It is your fault alone that has caused this disaster. You have neglected the Pandavas, who are like your own sons, and treated them harshly. Sitting in the gambling arena you called out like a child, what has been won see now what you have won. Laugh now as you did then, O king. Now you must face the vengeful Pandavas and their friend, the lord of all beings, Krishna. The Kauravas are about to sink like a whole boat in a shoreless ocean. Your hope for victory arises only from madness. Whoever despises the Pandavas will be destroyed. It is not proper that you now grieve, O Bharata. You have had ample opportunity to prevent this calamity, but you repeatedly ignored all good advice. Your lamentations are useless, O oh, chief among kings. Sanjaya returned to his seat at the foot of the kings and ministers. Dhritarashtra shook his head, fears running down his face and falling into his beard. Duryodhan began to worry that the king might decide to give in to the Pandavas. He leapt to his feet and said, There is nothing to fear, O oh, great king. You need not grieve for us. We are capable of winning the battle. When I heard that Yudhishthira had amassed an army and was intent upon war, I approached Bhishma, Drona and Kripa. I saw their advice, asking if they felt we should surrender or fight. Victory was by no means certain. Each of them assured me, you need fear no enemies. Let anyone come. We will curb their pride with our sharp arrows. No one can defeat us in battle declaring their loyalty to you, O king, they reassured me. I have faith in their words Bhishma alone overpowered all the world's kings at Kashi. Again, that hero subdued the invincible Wari or sage Parashurama. How can the Pandavas defeat him? What power do they have? They do not have their kingdom or their wealth. We are the lords of the earth. Now is the time for us to assert our supremacy and our rightful position. This kingdom is yours, O best of men. How can we surrender it to the enemy as usual? Dhritarashtra's mind was swayed by Duryodhan. It was true that Bhishma was an insuperable warrior. He had also been given a boon that he would die only at his own will. No one could kill him. If he declared his intention to fight with all his heart, then all was not lost. The king checked his tears as Duryodhan continued. Why are you struck with fear simply upon hearing descriptions of the enemy? Consider our own army, almost twice the size of theirs. Even Indra could not overpower our forces. That Yudhishthira asks only for five villages shows that he is afraid of our might. As far as Bhima is concerned, do not be afraid of him. None in this world can equal my mace fighting. I am a match even for Balorama, my tutor, and with a single blow I will dispatch Bhima to death's abode. I can break the hem of it mountain to pieces. I long to face Bhima in battle, Doryodhan scowled in anger at the thought of Bhima. He had had the palace artisans make an iron replica of Bhima. Each day the Korava would smash the iron statue with his huge mace. Soon he would have the opportunity to smash Bhima himself. 
As for Arjuna, how can he possibly be victorious when he fights with Bhishma, Drona, Kripa, Ashvatthama, Shalaya, Purisrava and Jayadratha simultaneously? Even Drona single-handed is more than a match for him. Born from the immortal Rishi Bharadvaja, no one can even look upon Drona when he is worked up in battle. Then there is Kripa, born from a powerful Rishi. No man or god can slay him. Then there is Karna, whom I consider to be the equal of Bhishma, Drona and Kripa combined. Even Indra came to him out of fear and begged for his natural armor. That lord of the gods has bestowed an infallible weapon upon Karna with which he will surely slay Arjuna. Doryodhan continued praising his forces and deriding the Pandavas. Naming all the kings on the Kaurava side, he breathed confidence into his father. There was no possibility the Pandavas could win the war Dhritarashtra could rest at ease. In conclusion, Doryodhan asked Sanjaya, with seven Akshohini divisions, what does Yudhishthira hope to achieve? Does he really think he can overpower us? Sanjaya smiled. Yudhishthira and his brothers are all cheerful. I did not detect any fear in the Marjuna mounted his heavenly chariot as I was leaving and said, I have seen divine omens foretelling our victory looking at Arjuna clad in mail and standing on his chariot as lightning sits within a cloud, I saw truth in his words, Doryodhan laughed sarcastically. You are always praising the Pandavas, whom we defeated at dice. Tell me about Arjuna's chariot. What sort of horses and banners are attached to it? Doryodhan had heard about Arjuna's divine chariot, given to him by Agni. Its steeds were given by the Gandharva chief, Sitraratha. He listened as Sanjaya described it. Arjuna's chariot is of celestial origin and cannot be impeded. It is drawn by white horses which move at the speed of the wind across both earth and sky. Sitraratha has granted him a boon that there will always be a hundred horses no matter how many are slain. I can barely describe Arjuna's banner. It was created by Vish the Karma, and it throws up a celestial illusion. It appears to extend in all directions for eight miles. It is impossible to ascertain of what the banner is made, but it resembles smoke mixed with fire. It has all the colors of Indra's bow. The terrible monkey Hanuman sits there, as do other celestial beings of terrifying form. Sanjaya described the other four Pandavas chariots. When he had finished, Dhritarashtra said, O Sanjaya, which of the Pandava warriors will contend with which of Mandrishta Duna, born from fire, has reserved Drona as his share? His brother Shikandi has marked out Bhishma, while the pious Yudhishthira has determined to slay his uncle Shalaya Doryodhan and his hundred brothers will belong to Bhima Arjuna has named Karna, Ashvathama and Jayadratha. Whoever in this world claims to be invincible, Arjuna will also slay. All of your grandsons, O king, will be met by Abhimanyu. The deceitful Shakuni belongs to Sehadev, while Nakula will engage with Shakuni's son Nuluka and the hordes of mountain fighters he leads. O leader of men, all the rulers and warriors in your army have been assigned to one or another of the Pandavas and their followers. Therefore, do quickly what needs to be done, for the battle will soon begin. Dhritarashtra again became fearful. His mind swung between hope and despair. He spoke again, trembling. All my foolish sons, who will face Bhima, have already ceased to exist. The other kings and rulers will all be slain by the Gandiva Boas mobs are killed when they enter fire. I see my army routed by the Pandavas, whom I have made into my enemies Yudhishthira's forces are like a formidable ocean my son desires to cross with his two arms Indra himself could not withstand such heroes who are cool and composed in battle and capable of breaking down the Himalayas. Alice, my wicked son desires to fight them, ignoring my protests, Doryodhan rose to his feet. Both parties are mortals. Why then do you ascribe victory as belonging only to them? Think again about the heroes arrayed on our side. Not even the gods combined could overpower them, what to speak of the puny Pandavas? O oh, sire, I do not consider the Pandavas capable of even gazing at our forces. The kings and rulers who wish me well will take hold of the Pandavas as deer are held in a trap. They will be vanquished along with all of their followers, Dhritarashtra sat shaking his head. His intelligence told him that the Pandavas, aided by Krishna, could not be defeated, but his heart was held by the strong grip of attachment for his sons. His choked voice echoed around the hall. See how my son raves like a maniac. Sanjaya, how will he ever defeat Yudhishthira in battle? 
Surely Bhishma knows the truth about the Pandavas' strength since he does not desire to fight with them. Tell us again of their prowess, Sanjaya. Let us be in no doubt of the danger we now face. Among the Pandavas' forces, Drishtadyana constantly incites them. He said, Go, Sanjaya, and tell the Kauravas their annihilation is imminent. Tell them they can only avert this calamity by sending a pure and honest man to Yudhishthira to return to him his kingdom. Do not let Arjuna release the fire of his anger at the Kaurus. He is protected by the gods in heaven and by the Supreme God himself. He cannot be slain. O Kaurus, do not even think of fighting with him. Dhritarash truck right out, covering his face. O Doryodhan, my son, he wailed, turn your mind from war. One half of this wide kingdom is more than enough for you and your ministers. Return to the Pandavas that which is theirs. All the Karu elders see this as the only virtuous path and you should accept it, my child. Apart from you and the small-minded son of Asuda, I do not think there are any here who desire war. Led by Karna, Dashashana and Shakuni, you are traveling the path to destruction. Come to your senses, dear son. Do not be misled, Dhritarashtra's words carried no authority. His plaintive cries were not taken seriously by anyone in the assembly. He had clearly abdicated his power to Duryodhana and would ultimately go along with whatever the prince decided. When Dhritarashtra had spoken, Duryodhana stood gazing defiantly around the assembly. He made his decision clear. I do not depend upon any of the warriors assembled on our side. Karna and I alone can perform the sacrifice of war, with Yudhishthira as the sacrificial beast. My chariot will be the sacrificial platform and my weapons the paraphernalia. My shafts will substitute for Kusha grass, while my wide fame will be the clarified butter. We shall perform the sacrifice in honor of the god of death and will come back crowned with a halo of glory. Let the war begin. Either I will rule the white earth after killing the Pandavas, or they will enjoy the kingdom after killing me." Doryodhan paused in order to add weight to his words. His voice, full of pride and arrogance, reverberated around the assembly hall. I can sacrifice my life, my wealth, my kingdom, my everything, O king, but I can never live in peace with the Pandavas. I will not surrender to them even as much land as can be pierced by the point of a needle. The hall remained silent after Doryodhan had taken his place on his throne. Bhishma and Vidura glanced at each other. Doryodhan's words did not surprise them. What could they say in reply? Only Dhritarashtra could check his son and he was not doing that, despite his pitiful entreaties. He still had given no strong order to return the Pandava's kingdom, nor was he telling anyone else to restrain Doryodhan. It was clear that destiny had ordained war. Dhritarashtra broke the silence. I grieve for all of you, O rulers, who are following this fool to death's abode. I cast off Doryodhan forever. Soon the Pandavas will move among our forces like tigers through a herd of deer. My army will fall like a helpless woman struck down by a wicked man. Beholding the Pandavas approaching like moving mountains, you will remember my words. O my sons, if you do not conclude peace now, you will meet with everlasting peace when you are struck by Bhima's mace." Doryodhan looked at Karna and Dushashana. His old father may be terrified by the thought of battle, but he could hardly wait. Alone or assisted by his Dhanuva inspired troops, he was ready. No other course was possible. Dhritarashtra asked Sanjaya to repeat to him what Krishna had said. Sanjaya related Krishna's words. After this he described another meeting he had had with both Krishna and Arjuna. I was invited to see them in Arjuna's quarters. With my mind fixed on sacred things I entered the innermost apartment in the palace, my head lowered and my hands clasped in prayer. The two great souls, however, put me at my ease. They were seated together on a golden bed bedecked with precious stones. Krishna's feet rested on Arjuna's lap and Arjuna's on Krishna's lap. Draupadi and Sutaya Bhama sat nearby like two shining moons. Arjuna pointed to a seat. I touched it with my hand and sat next to it on the floor. Krishna and Arjuna rose from their place, like a couple of sultries. Seeing the two black-complexioned heroes towering above me I was seized with fear. They were like Indra and Vishnu together. I realized that whoever has them on his side cannot possibly meet defeat, Sanjaya closed his eyes as he recalled the sight. He was silent for some moments, then continued in a subdued voice. After they had reassured me and offered me foods and drink, I placed my clasped hands on my head and told them of your desire for peace. 
O king, Arjuna then asked Krishna to make a suitable reply, whereupon the Arava leader spoke. His words were charming and mild, but their import was terrible. They were calculated to inspire fear in your son's hearts. He said, O Sanjaya, say this before Dhritarashtra and all the Kuru elders after offering them our respects and asking after their welfare. Tell them that they should now perform auspicious sacrifices and make numerous gifts to the Brahmins. Then they should make merry with their wives and sons, for they will soon face a calamity. I am thinking of my debt to Draupadi, which is still not paid. That chaste lady purchased me for all time when she cried out, O Govinda, amid the Kurus, who were afflicting her with pain tears streamed down Sanjaya's face as he thought of how Krishna gave himself completely to whomever sought his shelter. Krishna then spoke the following words, The Kurus have made the wielder of the Gandiva bow, with me as his second, their enemy. Who would dare challenge us in battle, even if they were assisted by the gods, unless their time had come? He who defeats Arjuna could hold up the earth in his two arms. He could burn up all creatures and destroy the heavens. Among all the beings within the three worlds, I do not see any to equal Arjuna in battle. Surely the fight at the Matsaya kingdom was sufficient evidence of that, what to speak of his encounter with the Danuvas in the netherworld. Strength, agility, prowess, lightness of hand, untiring energy and patience reside always in Arjuna and in no one else. Consider all this carefully before beginning hostilities, O Korus Sanjaya then told the Korus that Krishna planned to come to Hastinapura himself to encourage peace Dhritarashtra sat with his head bowed. He had spent many a long night pondering Arjuna's power, trying to weigh whether it could be countered by any of the Karu warriors. It was hard to decide. Now that Arjuna was united in battle with Krishna, the odds had shifted dramatically Krishna's power was impossible to estimate. He was said by the Rishis to be the lord of all divinities. Opposing him would surely mean opposing the gods themselves. The blind king spoke out with apprehension. These descriptions of Arjuna and Krishna only convince me all the more of the folly of war. O Duryodhan, think again. Think with whom you will be fighting. Great men always repay their debts. Agni is indebted to Arjuna for his assistance at Khandava. He will surely help Arjuna in the war. So will the god Dharma align himself with his son, Yudhishthira Bhima is Vayu's son and the twins are born of the two Ashvani gods. Thus it appears that we will be facing a force both human and divine. I cannot see how we can win. Son, make peace with the Pandavas. If you do not, then the Khorus end has come, Doryodhan was losing his patience. All this agonizing was too much. The prince jumped up in a rage. O oh best of kings, why do you keep praising the Pandavas? They are mortals like the rest of us. How will the gods come to their assistance? The gods are never impelled by base emotions. It is only by indifference to worldly desires, the absence of avarice, anger and hatred that they have attained their heavenly positions in the first place. They do not get involved in petty human struggles based on emotional attachments. Were this not the case, then how could the Pandavas have undergone so much suffering? And even if the gods do take their side, so what? I am the equal to any of them. By my own mystic power I can stop fire from burning even if it wishes to consume the three worlds. With incantations I can solidify water, enabling chariots and infantry to march over it. I can break apart mountains and send down showers of rocks accompanied by a gale like that which blows at the time of destruction, as he praised himself Doryodhan became increasingly enlivened. He flailed his arms and glared at the kings in the assembly. You all know that in my kingdom there are no natural calamities caused by gods. Due to my protection, there are not even frightful beasts or snakes to assail my subjects. All the citizens practice virtue and live peacefully under my rule. Neither the gods nor the Asuras would dare protect anyone hated by me. Why did the gods not prevent me from exiling the Pandavas or from taking their wealth? Whomever I desire to be happy or miserable meets with that end without fail. I am never thwarted in my aims. O monarch, my words will not prove false. I am known in this world as one who speaks the truth. The world witnesses my fame and glory. I say this only to console you and not out of self-praise. You will soon hear of the Pandava's defeat, rest assured. I am superior to them in intelligence, might, prowess, knowledge and ability. I shall destroy them, Doryodhan, who was now in the center of the hall, strode back to his seat Karna applauded him and himself stood to speak, 
disregarding Dhritarashtra, who had raised his hand to reply Karna's voice rang around the assembly. I will take it upon myself to kill the Pandavas. I have received the Brahmastra from Parashurama and the Sakti from Indra. With these two weapons I will destroy Pandu's sons. All of the other Khorus may stay with Duryodhan to protect him. Leave the Pandavas to me. Bhishma laughed loud and long. What are you saying, Karna? Your intelligence has obviously been dulled by death that now approaches you. Remembering the incident of the burning of Khandava, you should restrain yourself, foolish one. Your Shakti weapon, of which you are so proud, will be burned to ashes when Krishna's discus hits it. The Supreme Person has already destroyed enemies far greater than you, Karna. Meeting with him and Arjuna, you and all your weapons will be ruined, Bhishma reminded Karna how he had been cursed by Parashurama that, when he most needed it, he would not be able to remember the incantations to invoke the Brahmastra Karna had deceived the sage into thinking he was a Brahmin in order to receive his teachings. When Parashurama discovered the lie, he uttered this curse Karna would not be able to use the Brahmastra weapon when he was faced with imminent danger, and Arjuna would certainly not have the same difficulty Karna snarled. Your praise of Krishna is proper, O oh Grandfather. I know him to be as great, even greater, than you say, but I can no longer tolerate your cruel words toward me. Hear now the result of your harshness. I will not engage in battle as long as you are present. Rather, I will lay down my weapons until you are laid low. Then the world will see my prowess. Karna stormed out of the hall. Bhishma laughed again and turned toward Duryodhan. The Sudha's son is a man who keeps his word. How will he now fulfill his promise to wipe out the enemy troops? In this assembly I heard him say, All of you here shall be the witness. I will again and again kill thousands and tens of thousands of enemy soldiers. How will he act upon it now? He is passionate and arrogant. At the very moment he cheated the holy Rishi Parashurama he lost all virtue and ascetic merits, Doryodhan was perplexed by Karna's sudden departure but, maintaining a straight face, again asserted that he depended on no one. Whether or not Karna aided him, he would face the Pandavas and win. When the prince finally stopped boasting, Vidura rose from his seat and began to tell a story. There was once a fowler who set a net in the forest to capture birds. Two large birds were trapped in the net, but they rose up to the sky, carrying the net with them. The fowler saw this and ran after them. As he ran, an ascetic saw him and said, How strange that one who moves by his feet on the earth should run after those who wander in the sky. The fowler replied, Those birds united have been able to take my net, but they will fall down when they quarrel sure enough. Before long the two birds began to fight and they dropped to earth where the fowler caught and killed them. In the same way, brothers who fight one another are soon overpowered by death. O oh, Doryo Dun, cousin brothers should enjoy a life together, eating and sporting but never quarreling, Vidura confirmed what had already been said of the Pandava's power, trying to dissuade Doryo Dun from war. The prince said nothing. He already knew Vidura's opinion, and Vidura obviously favored the Pandavas. It was clear that the assembly had nothing more to say Sanjaya had delivered the Pandavas messages and the Khorus had replied Dhritarashtra's pathetic calls for peace were useless if he did not return even a portion of Yudhishthira's kingdom to him. Never once had he indicated that he was willing to do this. Therefore, unless Krishna was able to change his mind, there would be war. One by one the kings and ministers left the hall. At last Dhritarashtra sat alone with Sanjaya. Having heard everyone's opinions publicly expressed, the king now wanted to hear his secretary's opinion. Did he think there was any chance of the Khorus winning the war Sanjaya had seen both sides and was able to assess their respective strengths? Although Sanjaya had already stated that he saw little hope for the Khorus, still the king hoped that in private he would give him a clue as to how they might win Sanjaya was worried that if he spoke alone to the king his opinion might not be taken seriously. He knew that Dhritarashtra felt he was inclined toward Pandu's sons. He therefore asked if he could call for Vyasadev, who was present at the time in the palace. If Dhritarashtra saw that the wise Rishi agreed with Sanjaya's opinion, perhaps he would take it more seriously. The king agreed and also invited his wife Gondhori to be present. When both Vyasadev and Gondhori had taken their seats near the king, Sanjaya turned to address his spiritual master. Oh my lord, please grant me permission to speak to the king in your presence. 
he has asked about the Pandava strength, Vyasadeva lifted his right hand in blessing. O oh, Sanjaya, you should tell him everything about Krishna, for he is the Pandava's real power. With his hands folded Sanjaya said, O oh, king, you have again and again asked about the strengths and weaknesses of the Pandavas. Their strength can be measured simply by measuring that of Govinda, for his strength knows no limits. If the entire world were placed on one side and John Norton on the other, then he would surpass the world on the point of strength. He can reduce the earth and all its creatures to ashes in a moment. Where there is truth, where there is righteousness and virtue, where there is modesty, and where there is humanity, there you will find Krishna. And where there is Krishna, there will be victory. He is the soul of all beings come to this world as if in play. The Pandavas are merely the instruments of his desire. That all-powerful being desires to annihilate all the miscreant and irreligious elements in the world. O king, your sons are such an element, Dhritarashtra reached out for his wife's hand and held it tightly Sanjaya went on, Keshava is the lord of time, of death, and of moving and non-moving beings. Appearing as an ordinary man by his own illusion, he comes to this world. Those who know him are not deceived, the old monarch was curious to hear more about Krishna. He had always known that his secretary accepted Krishna as the supreme deity Sanjaya was Vyasadeva's disciple, who himself worshipped Krishna. The king was not sure Krishna was certainly extraordinary. It was astonishing how he had killed so many powerful demons, and the rishis all extolled him as the original divinity. Yet he appeared so human. The king asked, How is it that you accept Krishna as the supreme god? Why do you know him as such and I do not? Please explain this to me if you feel it is appropriate, Sanjaya. Those who are too attached to matter cannot know that great personality, Sanjaya replied. To them he remains a mystery, or they simply do not accept his existence as God. I am not enamored of material things and have kept my desires in check. At the same time, I carefully study the Vedas and faithfully hear from holy men, such as my spiritual master, Vyasadeva. Thus I have been able to know Keshava in some part. You too may acquire this knowledge, O king. Take shelter of Krishna, for he is your best well-wisher. Do not despise him or his advice. Your foolish son has no faith in Krishna and will lead you and the Khorus to destruction, Gandhori nodded in agreement. Our wicked-minded son will certainly bring destruction upon us. He is envious and vain and never listens to his elders' advice. After enhancing the joy of evil men in my grief, he will die at Bhima's hands. Only then will he remember his father's words, Vyasadeva, seated on an elevated seat spread with silk cushions, said, O king, you are dear to Krishna. Listen to my advice. Hear carefully from Sanjaya. He can tell you the path by which Krishna can be known and accepted as one's shelter. Only due to excessive desire and hatred are men denied knowledge of God. Coveting wealth and fame in this world, almost all men are fully absorbed in illusion. Thus they come under the control of death again and again. A wise man therefore gives up all attachments and takes to the path of liberation, which leads ultimately to Krishna. Dhritarashtra asked Sanjaya to describe that path. After bowing before Vyasadev, Sanjaya said, Sense control is the beginning of the path. Performance of sacrifice without sense control will not allow you to know God. Renunciation of sensual desires arises from the awakening of true knowledge, which is born of wisdom. Wisdom is gained by experience and by hearing from the wise. True wisdom means controlling the senses. One with controlled senses will experience pleasure within himself as he proceeds on the path of self-realization. By this path can you attain Keshava, O King. Follow that path with a genuine desire to know and please that most ancient of deities and success will be assured, Dhritarashtra asked his secretary to tell him more about Krishna's attributes and qualities Sanjaya told him of Krishna's various names and their different meanings which describe him as creator, sustainer and, ultimately, destroyer of everything material and spiritual. After hearing these descriptions Dhritarashtra became thoughtful. He dismissed Sanjaya. After Vyasadeva had also left, he sat alone with his wife. The old king was perplexed. He could not deny Krishna's supremacy. Sanjaya's descriptions, supported by Vyasadeva, were lucid and thorough. It was obvious that opposing Krishna and those backed by him was sure to end in defeat. But if it was Krishna's desire that the Khorus be destroyed, then what could he do? 
It seemed that his actions were all useless in the face of the Lord's divine plan. Dhritarash trust at sighing and holding his head. Did Krishna really desire that his sons, relatives and friends all be annihilated? Why, then, was he coming to Hastinapura to establish peace? It was a mystery the blind monarch could not unravel.